Welcome everyone, I'm Summer Bach, this is Guts and Glory, and today we have Kirsten Shockey with us. I am so excited to have her here because her and her, her husband Christopher, they contributed to the world of fermentation last year in a major way. They wrote this book, Fermented Vegetables, which is just so beautiful, so well done, and it has yummy recipes, gorgeous photos, and has just really compiled this world of lacto-fermentation, which we're gonna talk a lot more about here on this interview. Uh, so welcome, Kirsten, I'm really glad you're here. Thank you, Looks forward to talking. Well, I'm a little bit biased, because I'm in the book, but I'm also not biased, I'd like to think, because, you know, you have just done some amazing things in here, from, like, basil to grape leaves, You've talked about burdock and turmeric and even wild greens like nettles and lamb's quarters. Like, you know, most books that you look at when you're looking at fermented foods, you see green beans, you see cabbage, and you have really brought to it, I would say, just some really unique aspects to keep this creative for people maybe who have, do it, have been doing this for a long time. So I think this book, just reading it made my mouth water. So thanks oh, for nice. doing this. <laughs> Um, I added this book to our required reading list for the Fermentationist Certification Program this year because uh, oh. I just wanted to support my students to broaden their horizons about what spices and vegetables that they could use in lacto-fermentation. So before we go too much further into this, can you just talk about lacto-fermentation and that whole concept and like how this book is really designed around that one form of fermentation? Yeah, um, we... We were really, there's, there's now more and more books out there. Um, when we started writing this uh, about four or five years ago, actually the only book out there that was fermentation based was um, Wild Fermentation, of course, the, the one that started it all. But, um, you know, and as different books were coming out, we, we noticed that they couldn't help but put um, kombucha in there and yogurt and maybe cheese making and beer making and wine making because all of these fermentation arts are just super fun um, and and I get that because we've we've played with a lot of them and some of them we we you know do regularly water kefir and, and whatnot um, so we really wanted to just take one aspect of fermentation in this case fermented vegetables and really show folks um, the breadth of the possibility that it is really beyond sauerkraut and because the vegetables gain so much nutrient when you're doing the fermentation um, it's it's wonderful to see things like um, turmeric or whatnot you know just get get to be such a more uh, nutritious source through the fermentation and 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 then flavor I mean, flavor was a huge, huge motivator for us is, yeah, these foods taste great, but, you know, there's sort of that old school thinking from the 70s of, you know, these crunchy dense breads and that was whole foods and, and things like that. And, and people have this idea that, you know, whole foods can be yucky and, and it really felt important that this is not just about um, fermenting your vegetables and eating it because you have to, but it's about doing all this because it tastes good, because you're really only going to eat it regularly if it tastes good, <laughs> and you want to, and you're excited by it. That's a good point. So. I mean, let's be real. It has to taste <laughs> right? good. Yes. The only people I think will, who will eat things that don't taste good are people who are really sick, who know that they like have to choke down that crazy smoothie that tastes like pond scum in order to get better. But other than that, like our taste buds are a really important part of our survival. Absolutely, absolutely. And so the other thing we were thinking, um, you know, in that whole vein is, is we organized it with, of course, the learning part because we've had so many students that read it, read it online, and they just want to have a little more hand holding. So we tried to as much in the, a book as you can hold people's hands so they, they say, oh yeah, I can do this because um, we haven't grown up in a society where putting something on your counter and leaving it is um, okay. <laughs> you know, it's, and, then, and then eating it. 
And so, and then the second part was really that A to Z section. And um, because people do have uh, CSA boxes or they have their gardens and we wanted people to say, oh wow, the CSA gave us another round of turnips. You know, we can actually do something fun with that and flip to turnips. Right, and so when you say your A to Z section, you mean where you go through each of the vegetables that you can be mm -hmm. using. Yeah, I just wanted to show people just like some of these amazing, gorgeous pictures. Did you all take these pictures? Um, I made all the ferments, <laughs> but I did not uh, take pictures. I got to be on the photo set and that was done. Some of the pictures were done here and some were done um, teenagers <laughs> oh, nice. and some were done at a uh, studio in San Francisco. But they are your so, ferments. I mean, I, that's kind of what I meant. Like these are, yeah. yeah they were made here by me. <laughs> I mean, these photos are phenomenal and they just, I mean, they show a lot about what you have at your fingertips. So can you like, not anybody really could just like go out and write a book and have it look this good and like have all these beautiful things to show. Why is that? I mean, I know, I know what you have going on over there, but like tell everybody what your living situation is like and what your day to day is like that allows you to get into this so deeply. Um, well, the, the, we live in Southern Oregon, which is, is a wonderful place to live for food. Um, we ha we are blessed to have just a wonderful variety of small farmers and some of them are really pushing the envelope on, on what they can grow. Um, for example, you know, some of the things in there really are because one of my farmer friends would call me up and say, can you ferment parsnips? And, you know, it was like, well, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't see that I can't, so let's, let's try. And, you know, she grows things like um, saltwort or okahajiki greens. And so, yeah, that part of that is just, you know, the availability. And then we live, um, we have a little 40-acre property out in the hills of the Applegate Valley. And so, you know, we've got wild nettle growing on our creek uh, right now. In fact, I'm hoping to make some nettle kimchi later today, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so we just, we have an abundance around us from which to kind of use as the crayons for the, for the book. <laughs> nice. Really cool. Well, I guess, let's see. So I wanted to show, like, I loved, I loved that you featured Oli Kraut in here. <laughs> I love that little drawing and how you, when you featured, I mean, you featured a bunch of different um, fermented foods companies or essentially, or people who are fermenting as well. And I love the artist's rendition of those. And just what you brought together here is not just recipes that you all are bringing, but also recipes from some of these companies and just kind of showing this overall, well, I just, I, I don't know, I feel like you showed what, of this community looks like you know like in your book and you talked about like holding people's hands to walk them through that you I think that is wonderful and I think that's actually what makes your books really stand out to me is the way that you're holding people's hands through this process because if you've never fermented before so those of you watching this who have never fermented before um, you're probably where I was when I started which is that you're kind of afraid of it like you are like afraid that you could kill somebody if they taste what you make, right? I mean, that's like a huge thing. And that's one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, I, I just, I don't want to hurt anybody. And, you know, you can get sick if you do things wrong. And I love how you just really show people exactly how to do it because this is one of the easiest things. And there's new information out there that shows, I, I don't know if you've heard this, Dr. Mercola sent a sample of his sauerkraut in, his like homemade sauerkraut into the lab. And when they tested it, they found that there was, um, the, like for a 16 ounce jar was equivalent to eight bottles of probiotics. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I'd heard it was a huge number. I hadn't, I hadn't heard eight bottles, but eight wow. Eight bottles. So two yeah. ounces is a bottle of probiotics. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's be so wrong. much cheaper. <laughs> oh, it's so much cheaper. It's like an affordable way to do probiotics and you get 13 different strains and all of this. So. Um, I guess I'm curious, like, you know, is that, 
is part of why you're interested in lactoferments for the health benefits? So yeah, the, the health benefits and the probiotic reasons are um, definitely a huge motivator for us and we're super excited to share that with people and help them feel better. Um, I feel like, you know, healthy, healthy people, healthy bodies, it's just, it makes the whole world feel, you know, better. Sure. That's really, <laughs> but our, our real passion, I mean, a lot of where this started was around the whole food systems and around um, local food systems and sort of taking back whole foods and fermentation is one of the first first places humans use to get their food and keep it through the seasons and so how cool is that that we can take our now our local harvest and use it in January and February when we can't grow you know what we wanted to instead of importing our cabbages or whatever vegetable it is um, from elsewhere um, so that was that was a huge motivator. I've been passionate about real food and, and real food systems and sort of taking back that for people to get away from so much processed food and this is been a really great way to 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 work with that passion. Um, so that that's a huge is a huge motivator for me. And then, you know, again it comes back to the flavor because if people like it then they're going to reach out to their local farmer and, and buy those vegetables and have something yummy to eat in February that's still from their own community. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, for me, it's it's so cool to hear you talk about, you know, your farm and living on the farm and how that interconnects here because I feel like it's such, um, it's such an important part of the process that many people are missing. So a lot of people go and buy their fermented veggies at the store or at their local co-op or at Whole Foods or wherever. And, you know, so we kind of have it in our minds if we're doing that at the store that that's, you know, we'll go pick it up whenever. But when you're living on the farm and you are growing a lot of your food, it like you, you're doing it in a way that we used to do this. Like people used to agriculturally like have to live off of the land in a much different way. And I feel like, um, understanding that is a really huge part of understanding how these vegetable ferments evolved, like how they even came about in the first mm -hmm. place. Like, can you talk a little bit about the history and you know how people started doing this or, or what we know about that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody really knows where or when it started, um, <laughs> but it definitely is something that is across across the cultures and I'm sure it was discovered you know pretty simply you know somebody probably left something on the on the counter with salt on it um, what I think is really interesting historically in um, China is that salt was such an important ingredient and salt is such an important ingredient for our health um, we've, we've kind of use too much industrialized salt nowadays and so people are confused about how important salt is but salt was so expensive that actually fermenting the vegetables was a way to stretch that salt and that flavor um, which I find pretty fascinating you know there's the large grain rice portion and then they have availability of vegetables but this salt part that makes it all taste good um, was really, really rare and expensive. And so fermented vegetables was used in that way to, to stretch the salt, which I, I think is pretty cool. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Um, you know, and then when, when you were saying local eating, I think another interesting thing is, you know, our bodies up until very recently really had to eat what the land around us provided and you know, each year in our garden, even though, you know, you, you feel like you do the same things and the weather may or may not be similar, you still have ebbs and flows. You have some years that are just amazing pepper years or amazing um, tomato years. And then the next year you think, well, I did everything the same. You know, why is this different? But, you know, on a deeper level, you, you have to wonder, too, how much of um, just what what is 
growing out there around you. You know, this year's been a great morel year, so obviously we're eating a lot of morels right now, but that this year, for whatever reason, our bodies are needing that, that energy, um, if that makes sense. And so with living that lifestyle and trying to get back to, you know, what's really happening on the land here and now, um, I feel like that's probably also goes back to your original question is how did these things develop? I mean, they developed with what people had, you know, the, the ferments, kimchi ferments, for example, in Korea are very different in the different parts. They're different regions by simply what, what they had to preserve and what was available. Well, and so. these, I mean, these ferments literally saved people through the winter. Oh yeah. <laughs> The, the, the vitamin C part um, saved the sailors. I mean, that's the famous story of scurvy and, and uh, Captain Cook figuring that out. And I know that, I don't know about when you were selling at the farmer's market, but I know when I was selling ferments at the farmer's market, our best sales were in February and March when the really fresh greens hadn't really kicked in yet and, and folks were just craving this you know, nutrient dense, fresh tasting food with all those summer vitamins preserved. <laughs> Are you still selling at the farmer's market? We aren't. Mm -mm. No. And so, um, I mean, it's interesting. So when you did that, did you notice that people, well, when you say sauerkraut, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily associate that with what we're actually making when we say sauerkraut today. A lot of people associate sauerkraut with the stuff that has been pasteurized and canned, is either sitting in the pantry or sitting in the shelves in the grocery store. That's, you know, all the probiotics have been killed and it's still delicious, I think, and sour, but it's a different animal in a way than, than the live, raw, unpasteurized sauerkraut that's filled with probiotics. Did you find that people who maybe didn't like sauerkraut or fermented veggies would like it when they were trying this, uh, the, the raw version of it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we got so many crinkled noses, you know, I, I don't like sauerkraut or, you know, I forgot my hot dog or all, you know, those things. And, and usually if, and, and some people would just be curious about all the color and they didn't know they were walking into a fermented vegetable booth and, you know, then they try to scooch away when they realized there was sauerkraut there. But usually, you know, when they would stop and try something, um, they were often super surprised and, and often would, would even walk away with a jar because they suddenly, you know, we had people in the beginning of the season, of course, that hated it and then they tried it and then by the end of the season they they were addicted <laughs> because their their bodies were changing and they were craving those probiotics but yeah and, and in the book we have one of our our recipes that we always called at the market our gateway kraut and it was just a lemon <laughs> <I love> <laughs> because it it changed that perception of what they were going to eat enough um, that when they tried it and it was so fresh and vibrant, um, you know, it was like, oh, this is also sauerkraut. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, is your gateway kraut in your book? Yeah. Okay. It's lemon dill kraut in the book. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I Followed can't wait closely by dill. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, so what you've brought up is really what I consider to be one of the most fascinating aspects of this food, which is that you said customers would come and they would tr like crinkle their noses at it. They would try it. And then by the end of the season, we're like a devoted customer who, you know, we're eating probably a jar a week or, or more in some cases. And what I think is fascinating about that is that, you know, I always say I felt like I was, I really was onto something because I felt like I had stumbled upon an addictive healthy food. I was like, we've got to start a business because this is an addictive healthy food. Um, but what's fascinating there is like the body is, ta you taste it, you don't like it, and then your body responds and decides it likes it. Like there was so much benefit, is the way I, I view it. There was so much be benefit from, you know, what you got out of that sauerkraut that your body was then like, you know what, taste buds, we're going to start liking this now because we, <laughs> right. we need to. 
Uh-huh. So I, I'm fascinated by what is actually happening. And they talk a lot about the gut-brain connection when, um, when we're talking about the microbiome and all the bacteria that live in the gut and how they can communicate to the brain. And I think that, that fermented veggies, lacto-fermented veggies, are such a, um, uh, I would say, like probably one of the best places to really study if you want to figure out what this, what's going on with this gut-brain connection because there is a communication that's happening usually within a week of somebody trying it. Mm-hmm. It's so fascinating. It is so fascinating. And yeah, and we really did see it at the market stand. I mean, you know, people, you know, people like to share and sometimes you're thinking, wow, that's really more information than I need. But it was also fascinating to hear, you know, how just coming once a week and getting their little brine shot or, you know, taking their, their thing, their bottle jar home and how much they were with simply that change, how much they were feeling a difference in their, in their life, even if they weren't looking for a difference. (laughs) Yep, exactly. Well, and so there's a couple things. One, I just kind of want to like go over, um, can you just talk about the basics of lactofermentation and how that works? Sure. Um, so you've got your vegetable, um, any vegetable, and it's inherently um, got all everything it needs on it. It's got the lacto um, bacillus on there. It's got other bacteria, but everything you needs on the vegetable. And what you're doing is you're creating the environment um, conducive to lacto fermentation to take place. And so. Um, with sauerkraut, we'll just talk about cabbage because it's the easiest. Um, what you're doing is you're shredding it or you know, cutting it in a way that breaks down the cell walls, adding salt to continue that, um, that process and create a brine. And the, the salty brine is um, where the lactobacillus thrive. It sort of gives them the upper hand um, against sort of the competition for the other bacteria or the enzymes or the things that might want to try to rot the vegetable to do their thing. And they they get busy, they eat the starches and the carbs and the sugars and pretty quickly start creating um, an acidic environment. And as soon as that acidity starts moving in and gets below 4.6, which you don't actually have to test that at home, um, but that's the official number, things that E. coli or things that scare you that might live in it die. They just they can't live. They can't grow. Um, and like you said, Summer, there's so many folks that say, "Well, I did this and it looked okay, but I threw it away because I didn't want to kill my family." <laughs> and um, I think uh, that as far as everything I've been told and know, nobody has ever died from lacto fermented vegetables um, because of this process. And if it goes south on you, you actually know it goes south. Um, your, your senses, your, everything, um, smell, touch, taste, you wouldn't even get it to your mouth. It, it says don't put me in your mouth. Um, so the, the huge place I think that people um, maybe have a ba- batch go bad is, so you've got all your shredded stuff, your, your vegetables, and you put them in a jar. And then it's really important to press it down and get the air out. You're, you're doing this in an anaerobic environment. Um, and then keeping the air out, I think that's another place where people don't realize, you know, think of this as your little pet on your counter. And I encourage folks to try their first fermentation projects, not in a beautiful crock, even though we all like beautiful crocks, but in a little uh, mason jar because You can watch it, you can kind of get to know what's going on, you can (laughs) check on it, and if you do throw it away, it's not a huge investment in time and energy and and materials. And so what sometimes happens is, you know, as the process gets going and the carbon dioxide um, creates little bubbles, sometimes the brine can be on top of your vegetable and you don't really notice that you've got a lot of airspace in. And so... I encourage people to just watch it and press it again. It's not like canning where you can't touch it once you've started the process, and that's actually kind of the cool part. And you can taste it as you're going and really find that spot that you like it best, um, which is a huge 
a huge deal. Some people really like it super sour and they want it to go for weeks and weeks and weeks. And some people really prefer just kind of like a half sour dill, a, you know, a half sour kraut, you know, just partially sour. And, um, yeah, like interest- seven to 10 days or less. Right. Yeah. And, um, and in a warm house, it could, could even be, you know, a little faster, but, um, the interesting thing too, and I don't know, you might know more about this than I do, Summer, but um, that you're getting different colonies of the probiotic family in these different time frames. So if you eat it young and then maybe you keep it on your counter and you eat it throughout the week, at the end of the week as it's tasting different, you also might be you know, eating a higher quantity of a different quality. A colony of probiotics, which I think is kind of interesting too. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, and there are, it's, you know, the older that the ferment is, the longer it's been fermenting, you generally have a better established group of lactobacillus, like plantarum, which is, in some ways, it's one of the more desirables. But I think that what I've noticed is that when people first start eating lacto fermented veggies, they tend to like it a little bit younger, like a little bit like, you know, on the, like it's been only fermented a week. And I think that part of that is that it's less acidic and it's also, um, gonna, it, like if people start eating a younger ferment, they're not going to have as much of an onslaught of tons of bacteria in those first, you know, that first like introduction to it. They're just going to be like getting a sprinkling of probiotics versus that, like what we talked about with, um, Dr. McCullough's test where they, you know, it was like two ounces was like a full bottle of probiotic pills. So I think, you know, that's something to really think about is like, I've seen this a, like so many times where like people will, you know, at first they'll be eating it and they want it younger. And then as they eat more and more and more, they like it to be a little bit more sour, a little bit more sour. That's back to that, um, mind gut connection, right? I think so. <laughs> I really think so. Well, so I've been, um, I experimented, I'll show you really quick. I have it back here. I, I wanted to try out, you know, I, I always done it in little jars. I've never gotten really fancy or I have little crocs and you know, you can use uh, a lot of different things for fermenting crop, but I ended up getting some of these little picklet things cause I just wanted to see how it would go. And because it's kimchi and the kimchi can really get stinky. And so I was like, okay, right. I'm, gonna try to, I'm gonna try this in an airlock and just see, cause maybe then it won't, um, make my house all stinky because not everybody who lives in my house likes the smell of kimchi like I do. <laughs> they don't all appreciate it, huh? <laughs> well, they're that, like, yes, one day, but not yet. Um, so yeah, I just was experimenting with that and I, it's, I'm, I can't wait to see how it comes out, but I thought it was so cool the way they kind of have this whole little contraption where everything's, you know, all consolidated here. So the carbon dioxide can escape, but the oxygen can't come in. And the theory behind that, and, what, and it does work, you know, that you will get less mold that way. Because that's something I want to bring up is like mold is a really normal part of fermenting. I mean, it, it's I don't find it the most desirable, but it does happen. And all you have to do is scrape it off and it, it's not going to harm what's underneath. And so people, you know, if you did smell that, you wouldn't want to eat it if it had the mold on top. But if you scrape it off and you get all of that mold off, most of the time what's underneath there is still really good and fine. And, you know, I mean, are you, do you eat kraut that's had mold grow on the top of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same with, um... same with what? What did you say? Same with yeast. Oh, yeast. Uh Uh-oh. Yeast on top can make it slimy and yucky, but as soon as you get under it, I don't know if you saw that in the back of the book, we actually do have the scum gallery for that very purpose (laughs) to show people where, you know, the mold can happen, yeast can happen, and and what that means, and and definitely, yeah, you get back under that anaerobic layer and your crop's usually just just fine <laughs> the scum gallery is so funny um <laughs> so good well you know what's really cool is like i've tried some of your really interesting and unique experiments 
Um, I tried, what did you have? A smoky chipotle kabocha squash kraut. Mm-hmm. That was so delicious. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> do you still make that? We do. So, to, I mean, can you explain that to people? Because, I mean, most of the time, a lot of people think that, like, to make a fermented veggie, you need to use cabbage and some of these, like, basic brassicas. But you're not even using any cabbage in that one. What? Are, tell us more about that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got a – we've actually got a whole – I'm going aside here for a second, but we've actually got a whole grouping um, in there that I I know that for some folks, brassicas are a problem, and so I didn't want them to feel left out of this great food um, thing. And so there are definitely some recipes that that are completely brassica free. They they either rely on the kimchi relies on escarole instead of cabbage, um, and then yeah, squash ferments beautifully, and so. You shred the squash, and um, in this case, we add chipotle powder and um, some salt, and the process is exactly the same. You squish it in the jar, you get that brine, um, you try to keep it anaerobic, and, and yeah, you, you get a ferment that's quite delicious that way, too. Some, some of them... It's fun to, like beets, for example, you can do beets by themselves, but it's really a mess because they have so much sugar and it gets so thick and gooey. So beet kraut, it's just better to, to keep that cabbage in there and do half-half. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, with, I've noticed that with beets. Um, and then um, with, cab, uh, sorry, with squash, are there squashes that you can't do? Are there squashes that don't turn out well? Um, you know, I've been pretty lucky with all the different squashes that I've personally tried. Um, I've done, you know, definitely all those sweet meat varieties. I've done um, pumpkin, and it works as well. <clears throat> what I like to do with pumpkin instead of shredding it is actually using like a microplane um, mandolin kind of thing because you can get those really fine slices, and so you still get that breaking down of the cell structure and the salt gets in there, but you get a whole different texture. It's now it's instead of even something you would think of as a sauerkraut, it's now more of a um, fermented salad, if you will, because you get these different these different textures. And and I try to um, encourage people in the book to, you know, as they're learning about these different vegetables to try them in different forms try them shredded try them sliced really thin um try them whole chunks um we did do some whole chunk pumpkins and that was quickly taken off the list of things that work nicely <laughs> so don't try that one pumpkin pickles were not a <laughs> we're not delicious <laughs> so with the cat with the uh squash doing more, like shredding it more was the effective technique there Mm, yeah cool and the, the some of the sweet meat squashes are drier but it, it they work just fine that is uh, just takes it to a whole new level it really does that you can just do a full-on ferment i mean even your recipe for basil like it's sort of a chutney i guess but just like fermenting basil oh it's beautiful yeah well, that's, that's, I've been doing more and more of that. I've been really coming up with um, sort of the concept, and I started to in the book, you know, kind of put that out there, but I've been playing with it some more and just come up with some amazing ferments that are really dry, super concentrated um, spice, spice mixes or herb blends um, because I've just never been satisfied with dry basil, for example, <laughs> and I've never been satisfied with dried um, cilantro, it just does, those, those oils disappear and it just doesn't hold its flavor. And then I started experimenting with, yeah, what you can do. And it's pretty incredible. Once you have the technique figured out, you just, it's wide open. And that's sort of the exciting part about what's happened with fermented vegetables. Um, where we started was just trying to survive. And so we were growing as much you know, fill in the blank cabbage in Eastern Europe or whatever to get us through the winter. And it was good food. And it, it, like you said, 
got people through the winter. They lived through the winter because of this. Um, but now we've got this advantage of having so much availability. We have refrigerators, so we can really, it's, it's like it's experiencing a renaissance. It's like it's this old school thing, but it's coming back in this just incredibly new way. And, and that's why I loved including different folks in the book to say, you know, I'm not the only one out here pushing, pushing this flavor thing. And, um, and that's really exciting to me and the chefs and it's, it's just, it's still gaining momentum, which is kind of (laughs) cool. Oh, it's gaining a ton of momentum. I mean, I feel like we're, you know, we're just about to see that giant wave start to really build momentum. So, um, that's really fun. Do you have like a favorite ferment right now? Like a favorite one that you've been putting on your plate every day? Hmm. You know, it's funny right now. I'm, I'm kind of, my, my current favorite is a very simple one, but for some reason it's really tasting good right now is, um, it's sauerkraut made with leeks and cracked black pepper. So it's a re- lot of leeks are in it though. It's a really simple sauerkraut, but leeks ferment beautifully and it just, it's good breakfast, it's good lunch. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm headed out to get those nettles and th- that'll probably take over as my favorite soon. <laughs> I know once you get those nettles in your body, it's like you can't stop. You can't get enough. That's awesome. Well, tell me really quick, what was it like the process of writing this book? I mean, I'm really curious about that. Like how long did it take? Did you have to devote time every day to writing? Like how would that go? Um, you know, since it was our first book and we really, you know, didn't, um, have a, a set, we knew we wanted the A to Z. We really knew we wanted to teach people how to do this, to make them comfortable, um, because that was a huge part of, of it. And then we also realized from the market that, yeah, people love eating it straight out of a jar, but they also want to know some other things to do with it. So there was, there was two aspects. There was the writing, and then there was the experimenting. And as the as the book started filling in, we started to see where the, where the blanks were, you know, it's like, okay, we really only have, you know, one dinner recipe right now. We better start because we eat it. We eat fermented vegetables just with with so much of everything and, and I throw it into anything. So actually, bring it around and make it a recipe. That was, that was part of the process. Um, but it took us three years and a lot of that was we were doing some of it while we were, um, working, you know, with making hundreds of pounds of ferments a week. And so there's just so much time in the day. Um, so there was probably about 10 months in that three years where we were full on market season and taking notes and that's about it. And so, yeah, this, this particular book, the process, I think, was pretty um, scattered and haphazard. I'm working on a second one now, and I feel like, okay, <laughs> here's the outline. And I know it might change a little bit, but I think the outline for fermented vegetables changed, I don't know, <laughs> 10 times. <laughs> That's awesome. What, are, you, are you at liberty to tell us what your next book is about at all? Yeah, we just signed the contract. It's um, fiery ferments, so it's all going to be hot. But the exciting part is it's not just going to be based on chilies. I'm trying to look at the world before before Columbus took the chili, you know, to the rest of the world. And so we're going to have a lot of ginger ferments and a lot of um, green peppercorns I've been pretty excited about lately. <laughs> So yeah, so we're, everything's going to be spicy, but not necessarily peppery. That is awesome. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, we're pretty excited. I think it's, and the, and the experiments have been fun. <laughs> I bet. I mean, whew. Yeah. 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 I, I, this summer, it's my hope to um, gather some folks to do some recipe testing for me, you know, around the country and and just send some of the recipes out. Because it's hot, it's harder for me to taste it as much. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. The changes I'm trying to make. Well, 
I mean, what is your motivator for experimenting besides writing the book? Like what, I mean, obviously like you had to be an experimenter to even get into this, you know, writing these books and like starting to try to make all these different recipes. Where does that come from for you? What inspires you? Um, you know, I'm just, I think I'm fascinated by what the flavor can do. And I, I think I love having this idea and saying, wow, I wonder what that would do. I, I think it's, it's what you said. I just have this experiment part and for whatever reason, it certainly wasn't anything I set out to do. You know, it, I, I've been successful at it. It, you know, it works. Most of what I put together, you know, we all want to eat. <laughs> and so I think I'm just enjoying that it's so new that it's pushing the flavor of something that hasn't been pushed yet. You know, I mean, pies are wonderful, but, and you can do new things with pies, but you kind of know what a pie is going to taste like. And um, I think there's something about saying, wow, you know, I'm going to get myself a pound of green peppercorns and see, you know, what we can do with this to, to just create a flavor that's not out there yet. You know, take, I like, I like, I read a lot of history books and I read a lot of um, old cookbooks and I like to look at what's been done and then tweak it. Very cool. Well, why? (laughs) Yeah. Well, how can people learn more about you and your husband and the work that you all are doing? Um, we do have a website, um, fermentista.kitchen is the website. Um, that's probably the best way. So did you and, say fermentista.kitchen? Uh, uh-huh, fermentista.kitchen. And then we have, are also on, you know, Facebook and Twitter. Um, Kirsten K. Shockey is mine at Twitter and his is at fermentista. Awesome. Yeah. All right, everybody go check that out. But also, like, just another here we go another look at the book this is a must-have for your fermentation resource library i mean it really is there are things in here that are not covered anywhere else and there are recipes and inspirations and you know honestly it is just i think it's one of the best books i've seen come together even if, as if you take it out and just put it in the recipe category alone it's just so well put together in that way and you get a little drawing of me in there. So there, there okay. <laughs> back when I had some bangs. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I just want everybody to go out and get this book. I was totally blown away and I'm, I'm like, it got my juices flowing as far as creativity. And I just got really excited about some of the things that I'm going to start making and things I've never even thought of. And just, I can't wait to get started. I mean, I'm the basil and like you mentioned the cilantro, that's where I'm at with it. I can't wait to see how those come out. So thanks for inspiring me. Absolutely. And thanks for being here on Guts and Glory where everybody gets a chance to learn more about, you know, what you're doing here behind the scenes and getting ready for your upcoming book in the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And it's so good to talk to you again. It's been a few years. It has been a few years. Thanks. (laughs) All right. Well, everyone, this is Summer Bach and Kirsten Shockey, and we're signing out.